everyone, and welcome back to Pain Points. I'm Dr. Jake Kaler, um, based out of Austin, Texas, doing these education sessions really so that we can work on advocacy and really exploring different pain options uh, for, for patients through education. Um, as always, this is an interactive session, the goal of which is education, so ask questions uh, or leave them in the comments on either our Facebook or YouTube page, and we can address them later. Uh, today, we're going to be doing part four of our spinal cord stimulation series. And the goal of today is actually to look at some other things that you might not have thought about with spinal cord stimulators. And today, we're going to be specifically talking about MRI uh, and the importance of MRI as a tool for pain physicians, as well as other spine physicians, uh, or surveillance for other indications such as cancer screening. Now, this talk is gonna not just really focus on spinal cord stimulation, but there's actually broad applicability. So if you have a patient that's going to be getting in, uh, needing an MRI, then we need to not think about it just for spinal cord stimulation. We always need, we already need to think about other devices such as uh, implanted cardiac devices or other devices that might not be MRI compatible. So that's really what we're going to be talking about today, but with specific focus towards spinal cord stimulation. So today we're going to do a quick recap. If you haven't joined us on the last three segments, this will just get you very quickly up to speed on what is spinal cord stimulation, what are the three ways it works, um, and then we're going to be talking about MRI after that. So what is MRI and who needs one? Uh, also, how does an MRI machine work? Why are there so many precautions about MRIs? And let's talk about device compatibility with MRI, and I'm going to throw a few examples out there where we can talk about uh, the importance of having a device that works with MRI, but also what are the certain conditions that MRI might, might need to be operated under in order to be used. So all things that us as patients don't normally have to think about, but it's important when we think about it from an advocacy standpoint, because it's actually really important. There's a lot of information out there where you might see everything's MRI compatible. Well, yes, you can put something in an MRI machine, but it might be under very, very particular situations. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. On the right side of this picture here, you can actually see a single spinal cord stimulator lead. And as a to kick off our recap here, we have a stimulator lead that's sitting on the back of the spinal cord where the sensory nerves are. That's where the pain sensation comes into the spinal cord and then goes to the brain. And here is a single wire that has multiple electrodes on it. And we can utilize these multiple electrodes uh, in order to send specific waveforms. Those, so those waveforms might look right, like the one on the top or the one on the bottom, or we might be running them concurrently at multiple different levels targeting particular types of pain. Uh, but either way, spinal cord stimulation is broken up into two parts. The first part is the trial, and the second part is the permanent implant and the programming that happens thereafter. When we think about how spinal cord stimulation works, there's three big ways that it works. The first way and the most important way uh, is that it, it actually increases these powerful pain relieving neurotransmitters. And that happens both in the brain, happens in the spinal cord, and also at the level of inflammation within the spinal cord itself. And we see this uh, because the brain is actually able to control the sensation that it receives. And I've, I've used this example before and I use it with my patients, but if you say, for example, aren't thinking about your left pinky toe right now, and now all of a sudden you are, that's an example of your brain's ability to filter out all of this other information. And we call that the descending pathways. That's the second way. Uh, the third way that it works, and, and actually this is the most important way, is actually decreases inflammation within the spinal cord. And when, one thing that we know about chronic pain, if you have these signals that are going over and over and over again uh, from either a joint or the spine or what have you, that can cause inflammation in the spinal cord and brain, and spinal cord stimulation has actually been shown to slow this down. So when we look at pain pathways, our brain is able to control, and you can see this, this blinking blue ball here is gonna drop down to the spinal cord. That's our brain controlling information that comes to it. So if you had a pain signal that comes in now, that's the blinking red ball, it's going to be able to stop that pain signal from ever reaching the brain. And that's one of the very powerful ways that these three different mechanisms are able to give you excellent long-term pain relief. And here's an overlay of an actual spinal cord stimulator. And here we would have to stimulate depending on where the patient has pain. Is it upper extremity and neck? Is it abdominal? Is it lower extremity and back? All these things need to be considered. So let's move on to MRIs now. So what is an MRI? 
An MRI is a special test. It's a scan that does not involve radiation, such as what what happened with an x-ray or a CT scanner, but it specifically it allows us to look very, very closely at the soft tissues. And on the right here is an example of uh, two different sequences of the MRI, the T2 and the T1 weighted sequence. And you can actually see this is the same picture, but different colorations of that. And those are different kind of uh, interpretations of the data. And that allows us to discern between what is water, what is fat, what is other soft tissue, and what what in the heck is going on here? The different weighting allows us to change uh, to see even small changes. So we don't have to see just huge changes. These can be very, very small changes. And it, 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 with MRI specifically, it's important to know that in order to get better focus and in order to look and have more clarity, more detail in the picture, we need a stronger and stronger magnet. And so that's one of the things when you hear about the Tesla ranking system, my device can go through 1.5 Tesla versus 3 Tesla versus 7 Tesla. All of these things are really, really important in, in determining the clarity of the picture. So the theme of this is you can put a lot of stuff through an MRI machine and it'll be okay. But the question is, what is the result on the other side going to look like? We can see how much water is left in the disc here for as an example, and we can see that some of those lower discs don't look as nice as some of the upper discs. On the left image, the A, you can see that the fluid is white, and in this we can see there's some fluid in the disc. That's wonderful, but as we look at the lower lumbar spine, we can see there's not as much fluid. We can also see some inflammation in the end plates lower down, and that's really, really important for us to be able to see as spine physicians. But it's not just the spine we look at. We look at the brain. We look at the breast. We look at a number of different tissues such as the heart and the liver. All of these different MRIs are really, really important for us to be able to see for patients. And that's why when we utilize devices, it's important as, for us as physicians to understand the implication of putting that device in a patient. I had a conversation with a patient earlier today and she asked me about the MRI compatibility and I had to take a step back and say, I actually don't know this one off the top of my head. I need to look this one up. And that is critically important because if we're putting this device in, we should also be talking about what is the consequence of that with the, with the, with the patient going forward. So who needs an MRI? Uh, an MRI is useful in patients where soft tissue really needs to be evaluated in detail. And I want you to look at this picture on the right. The picture on the right is actually a CT scan of the brain. You might say, that's Dr. Kayla, that's not an MRI, and you're right, that's a CT scan. Uh, but I use this to show the, the difference in clarity that you can see with a CT scan versus an MRI, or actually the opposite there. Uh, examples of reasons we need MRI, stroke or tumor of the brain, uh, cancer surveillance when we're, when we're doing a full cancer workup, uh, certain diseases such as multiple sclerosis where we need to be able to evaluate and, and see how the lesions are changing in time and space. We need to look at the heart and see, and see how the heart is doing, the liver, uh, as well as normal um, kind of bread and butter stuff that I deal with every day, which is looking at the spine or other musculoskeletal structures such as large joints. So all of these things need to be taken together. Now take a look at this picture on the right, and I'm going to show you some MRIs, and I'm going to show you how much more detail these MRIs can have. You can see when we look at it, it might be a little bit more fuzzy because I blew it up off a small picture I found on Google, um, but you actually get to see all of these little tissues, and you can actually see the gray matter, the white matter, the junction, and you can see this patient uh, over here on the right had a stroke. And then you can see some other views where you can actually get a better, clearer picture of that. And this is the importance of an MRI as opposed to just an X-ray. So how does an MRI work? An MRI is essentially a huge magnet and the patient goes into this hole where the magnet is around and we're able to change the actual orientation of various water molecules, the protons specifically, and the orientation of the protons on water molecules. And we can sense this, and that allows us to do this really, really finite work where, or this really, really delicate work where we can see the changes in soft tissue. Um, and so each molecule of water in your body has a proton that's pointing one way or another. And that's an oversimplification of this. So if you're a, a physicist and you're saying, Dr. Kalo, that's not how it works, and say that's probably true, but this is for, for the purpose of this, we're looking at the orientation of protons 
uh, relative to, to the hydrogen. And just like a compass will point north or, north or south, water molecules can point one direction or another, or specifically the hydrogen, the proton and the hydrogens can. And a powerful magnet can align all of these things, like the needles of many, many compasses. So you can think of all of our water in, in, our, in our body being a tiny compass, and you have these, these millions and billions of molecules that are able to actually point in one direction. And now all of a sudden, with, with a powerful enough magnet, we can change the direction of all these little water molecules and take an image, take a, take a reading to figure out after we disrupt it, take a reading to figure out which way everything's pointed. And so when we have the MRI off or the magnets not off, this would be us just kind of walking around every day. And you can see all of these things are pointing in different directions. But if we apply this special magnetic field, we can actually get them to point in one direction. And then after that, we can send a shock through the whole system and measure the response. And that is a down and dirty, overly simplified way that an MRI works. It's way above my pay grade. But the important thing is, it's a magnet, and magnets don't work very well with electrical devices. And these are two examples. This is the picture you get out the other side. You might get a normal picture, or you might get a picture on the right, like someone who's having a really, really bad time with their spinal cord, their cervical spinal cord. And overall, you get, in, you get a picture that allows us to see into the soft tissue, see into the spine and the brain, and figure out what is going on, or at least give us a clue as to which way we need to go. So why does, why does MRI matter for spinal cord stimulation? Well, I told you it's a giant magnet, and a giant magnet doesn't always play nicely with electrical devices. In fact, if you want to mess up a lot of electrical devices, you use a giant magnet on them. Additionally, if you have a wire that's coiled up, and you take that and throw it in a really strong magnet and power that bad boy up, you're, you can actually induce an electrical current. So we're not just worried about the device malfunctioning, we're also worried about potentially burning the patient or shocking the patient through these coiled electrical wires. And that's why this stuff actually matters. Um, so 98% of patients will require an MRI within 10 years. So that's one of the reasons that MRI compatibility is extremely important. Um, spinal cord stimulation, it's an electrical device and it can have this function in the presence of that magnet. Um, and the other thing that I think is really, really important is you might hear even physicians throw around the idea that something is MRI safe. But in reality, there's something called MRI conditional. All devices that we utilize are actually MRI conditional. And what that means is you can't just throw it in an MRI and let it go. You have to use very specific criteria that are calculated and determined for that device. So how that device is built is really, really important. And so, like I was saying before, the MRI machine has to be utilized in a specific way for that patient to get an MRI. And that, mean, that might mean you don't get the high grade picture. It might mean you get the lower grade picture, or it might mean that you can't be placed in certain positions like lying on your belly or lying on your side or what have you. All these things are really, really important and required for different types of MRIs. And so there's a number of different conditions that are out there. And a lot, of the, a lot of the big companies that are out there have different criteria. And you can see that in most of these companies, besides the last one, uh, which is a newer, uh, newer company to the game called Saluda, um, a lot of these companies uh, have MRI compatibility or uh, conditionality. And so that's one of the things that's really, really important is figuring out, okay, what are different reasons you can get an MRI um, or different, different reasons you can or cannot get an MRI? And this is the importance of, of being very, very specific and thoughtful with regard to our systems. And that does not mean that, that the, you, you can't get an MRI. It just might mean we have to do some extra things to be able to, to get to that position, to be able to do an MRI. Now, I said this earlier, but what is the difference between a lower power magnet and a higher power magnet? And I use this picture to really show the difference in, in actual blood vessels that are taken between different magnets. And one of the things we see is that as you use a stronger magnet, you're able to get finer and finer detail. You're able to see all these other little branches. So take a look at the brain on the left compared to the brain on the right. Look at all of these different branches of the vascular tree you can see. And that's one of the things that you get with using a stronger magnet. But again, with a stronger magnet, you might not be able to use 
um, your, your device, or you might not be able to get that MRI if you have a device in place. So whether these are cardiac devices, whether these are spinal cord stimulators, it's important to have a conversation with the physician regarding the device and make sure that that one is right for you so that we know going into the implantation what the device can and can't be MRI'd. And, and most of these are going to be quite useful, but this is why I wanna point this out. Whether the patient is getting a cardiac stimulator um, or a neurostimulator for the spine, I think it's good to know the limitations of that because it gets really, really confusing. And oftentimes even other physicians uh, that, I, that I know don't, don't know the difference. So that's, that's one of the things that I really wanted to bring to light here. At this time, I'll, I'll take any questions. Um, and as we go forward, um, as always, let me know what you wanna talk about. Um, we're on every Thursday, except for next Thursday. I apologize, I am taking the Thursday off, but we'll be back to it the week after, and we'll be talking about pain pumps or intrathecal drug delivery, which just like spinal cord stimulation is something that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, and I, I think that it, it should be done in a very specific way. So I wanna be able to share that with you um, and also share why we're so successful here at PSA uh, with our intrathecal drug delivery program. So. Uh, thanks for joining me. If you have any questions, throw them out. Otherwise, I'll see you all in two weeks. Mm -hmm.